Good morning, Pastor Connor here. It's 7.30 on March 11th. Thank you for taking time to be with me today, joining me whenever it works for your schedule. If you're live with me, glad to have you. If you're joining me at a different time during the day, wonderful. I'm glad it works for your schedule whenever it works. Okay, so we're right in the middle of Holy Week. And yesterday we looked at that hymn, Right On, Right On in Majesty, that marvelous hymn that, that really uh, clo it closes out our Palm Sunday observance. We enter with the grand hosannas. We, we end with this right on in lowly pomp to die. Well, today I want to slow down a little bit and look at the text of Holy Week, or, or, um, Palm Sunday, uh, because we didn't have a time really to, to look at it in any detail on Sunday because we have the passion narrative and that takes up a huge portion of our service. So I'm going to read the first uh, several verses of Matthew chapter 21. And really some remarkable stuff in here. So I'm gonna, we're going to read and comment as we go along. But we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21. We'll go up through verse 17. So uh, I better get moving. Okay, so now uh, Matthew says, Now when, the day, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Okay, now... Um, briefly here think about this all right so number one um it, it's shocking enough that jesus even shows up in jerusalem because remember he's not headed up to walmart to pick up a few things jerusalem is the hotbed of opposition i mean he's basically as i've said before he's walking into a hornet's nest so it's remarkable he's even there he's he began his journey back in galilee and roughly, I mean, if you take a straight shot, uh, which Jesus didn't go necessarily straight, it'd be about a 90-mile walk-ish. So probably, you know, all told, at least 100 miles of walking. So he walks for 100 miles and gets there and says, hey, can you go get me a donkey to ride on? You have to say to yourself, well, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> What's the likelihood he gets tired for the last little bit? Yeah, n not too likely. If a man's going to walk 100 miles, he's not going to need a donkey for the last little bit. So he's asking for this donkey, obviously for specific symbolic reasons. That he's, he's trying to communicate something when he asks for this. So there's, there's a message in this donkey, if you will, that he wants us to see. And uh, Matthew's going to help us see that. So let's, let's journey on. He says, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. Now that in itself asks, it raises all kinds of questions like, why? How? Well, it seems pretty obvious Jesus has had some, some advanced communication because he's going to go on later and talk about preparing the Passover and, you know, um, just basically you tell them that the master needs it and they'll make sure you have it. So clearly there's some advanced communication going on. We don't know what. But anyway, tell them the Lord needs it. They'll send it at once. Then Matthew says, the gospel writer, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying. All right, so Matthew highlights fulfillment a lot. If you read through the gospel of Matthew, he loves the word Fulfillment or fulfill. This took place to fulfill. Matthew knows his scripture so, so very well. And he sees how Christ is fulfilling the pages of scripture, even the pages, pages of scripture that weren't direct prophecies, right? Uh, so he even sees Christ fulfilling uh, sections that weren't prophetic. Now this here is prophetic. You have this text in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 9. Actually here what Matthew does is he borrows an introductory phrase from Isaiah 62 and he slaps it on this prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, which Matthew felt free to do all the time. He was, he was very comfortable with the Old Testament and felt free to combine uh, prophetic voices whenever he wanted to. So this prophetic text back in Zechariah chapter 9, the people of Israel basically are harassed um that they are feeling like that their return to their homeland from exile is never going to be what they thought it was 
that the rebuilt temple isn't going to be as glorious as they had hoped. I mean, it was it was a situation of despair that that. Well, I mean, I guess you could say it like this. You know, if you put it in our modern context, just to give it some, uh, just to get to grab the feeling here, we've been going through this pandemic and we're making progress, but it seems like some days, like we're never going to get out of it. Like we're never going to be free from this, that we're never going to have a normal world again. So there's, there's, there can be this feeling of uh, prolonged discouragement. So that's a little bit of the mood that Zechariah is experiencing when he writes, the people of Israel are experiencing. And Zechariah says, hey, rejoice greatly because your king is coming. And he's going to be on a donkey. Whoa, okay, <laughs> that's a big deal. So what's the symbol Jesus is grasping at here? I want you to see, uh, you know that prophecy in Zechariah? It was about me. <laughs> so again, Think about this. If Jesus isn't the Son of God, he's either crazy or he's the most egotistical person we've ever known. Because who does that? Who says, oh yeah, that prophecy is about me? Right? Either you have to be the Son of God or you're crazy or you are just so full of yourself. Now we know he's not full of himself and we know he's not crazy, so we, we know he's the Son of God, but it's remarkable. So. Say to the daughter of Zion, which is just a phrase for the people of Israel, for Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, and the, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them, on the cloaks. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, you know this, but that's from Psalm 118, one of the Hallel Psalms. The Hallel Psalms, uh, it's from we get the word Hallelujah. Uh, it means praise Yahweh. Hallel simply means praise. These are the praise Psalms. They were often used during times of national deliverance, national celebration, or the return of your king, this, this sort of triumphal parades and so forth. So these were, they had a national flavor to them, but they also had a, um, a theological hope woven into them. So this is what I find so amazing, right? These people know their Bible too. At least they know the liturgy that, that was connected to scripture. And so this is the liturgy that they're basically singing and shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Well, son of David is a messianic term. I mean, there's kingly overtones, there's messianic overtones. Uh, this is, this is a, it's a, it's politically charged. There's, there's all kinds of stuff going on in this, this phrase, in, in this quoting of Psalm 118. Okay, and when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? I mean, that would be a reasonable question, right? Who is this guy who's causing people to quote Psalm 118? He's riding on a donkey with kind of a messianic complex. Who does he think he is? And the crowd says, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, you got to love this, all right? Galilee was, I mean, if you were a, a Jerusalem Jew, I mean, you have Galilean Jews and Jerusalem Jews, to give you a little bit of a flavor here, um, this would be the way that kind of your New York elites would look at Iowans. Oh, you're from Iowa. That's real nice good for you, that sort of thing. There was a little bit of kind of look down your nose at those simpletons. This is Jesus, the, that, that simpleton from Nazareth, from Galilee, right? So remember uh, when Peter warms himself by the fire during Jesus' trial, and they say to him, yeah, 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 you're with that Jesus because your accent gives you away. He was a Galilean. So the accent was viewed as a simpleton, like a signal of a simpleton. And here's this Jesus with this messianic complex riding into town. People are singing his praises. They're throwing their cloaks on the ground. They're waving palm branches. Yeah, the city stirred up because this, this simpleton is claiming all kinds of praise. Who does he think he is? 
And by the way, um, just to give you a flavor for how many people would be there, so normal times, Jerusalem in this time would be about 50,000 people, good sized city. During Passover week, anywhere from 150 to 200,000 people. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a zoo. So, going on, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. All right, so sometimes this is called the cleansing of the temple. And okay, I think it's probably better called the judgment of the temple. Because think about it, the temple precincts were huge. If you're gonna walk around just the temple precincts, it would take you about a mile to get around the, the temple precincts. This is a huge complex. So Jesus clearly isn't clean, cleansing everything because this is a huge complex. This is more symbolic in nature and it's judgment on the temple. He actually says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it, you make it a den of robbers or a hideout of thieves. So the idea here is um, you are making this the place where you are devising your evil schemes. Further, when he quotes this, uh, my house shall be called a house of prayer, he's reaching back into Isaiah chapter 56. And there's this beautiful promise to the Gentiles, to, to non-Jews, that even they will be included in God's people, that their sacrifices will be accepted, that, that they will be adopted in. Beautiful promise made to non-Jews there in Isaiah 56. Well, this section of the temple would be the court of the Gentiles where Gentiles could come and pray. And this was the place that these money changers had set up shop to do their dealings. Now, doing the dealings themselves wasn't the problem because you had people coming from hundreds and hundreds of miles away and you're gonna offer a sacrifice. So you're gonna to need to purchase your sacrificial animal there as opposed to trying to transport your sacrificial animal on foot for 100 miles, they're not going to make it there uh, unblemished. Let's put it that way. And you needed to have the official coinage of the region, so you had to have your money exchanged. So this was a service they could rightly provide for, for pilgrims for the Passover, but they're setting it up in a place they really shouldn't be. This is supposed to be a house of prayer, and there are animals everywhere and money changers everywhere. Not so helpful for praying. So Jesus is reminding them of two things, that the Gentiles are to be welcomed into God's people, which is remarkable enough, which Jesus himself is going to accomplish. And you're basically setting up your shop here in the temple and working your deeds of evil in rejecting, ultimately, the Christ. Going on, and the, this, this next phrase is so remarkable. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Just this throwaway phrase. How many? We don't know. The, I mean, so you talk about the healing of the blind man in John chapter 9. Well, here you have blind people, lots of them apparently. It's, it's an astonishing throwaway phrase. We'd love to know more about it, but Matthew just kind of throws it out there. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. So this is where the hymn uh, Hosanna, lot Hosanna, that the children sang their praises, the simplest and the best. It comes from here, right? The children were in participating in this procession. So when they heard this, they were indignant and they said to him, do you hear what, the, what these are saying? You hear what these kids are saying? They're, they're hailing you as this coming king. Jesus, you've got to stop them. You clearly don't believe that you, a prophet from Galilee, that you really are who they're, they're claiming you are. Really, Jesus, you need to stop them. And Jesus says this, have you never read? In other words, he's saying, haven't you read your Bibles? He's saying this to the chief priest. Yeah, can you imagine how well that went over? But listen to what he says. Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. Do you know what he's quoting? He's quoting Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is a, basically a praise psalm to Yahweh. Give praise to Yahweh. Process this. Jesus is saying, don't you know your Bibles? The Lord's going to raise up praise for himself, even through babies, even through infants, even through little children. And they're giving that praise to me rightly. Right. You should hear a collective gasp at this point in the text. Who do you think you are, Jesus? 
not only are you, you accepting that, that their claims that you're somehow this kingly messianic figure, but you are accepting the praise reserved for Yahweh only? You, you know, someone once said it, it's amazing it took Jesus three whole years to get crucified. Because you say things like that, it gets people pretty worked up. So we've said it before, either Jesus is just certifiably crazy, or he's the most egotistical person you've ever met, or he is, in fact, the Son of God. The text ends like this, and leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Okay, so all this is happening on Palm Sunday. A marvelous, marvelous account, uh, and sets up Holy Week and really drives us to where we're headed tomorrow, Monday, Thursday, and Friday, Good Friday. Uh, so we're going to talk more about those tomorrow. But what a marvelous text. So much packed into those so few verses. We need, though, to stop and pray. Let's do that. Lord of glory, the people of Jerusalem, even the children of Jerusalem, welcomed King Jesus as he rode into their midst on a humble donkey. They strewed their cloaks on the ground before him and waved branches in the air as they hailed their coming king. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. By the working of your spirit through your word, prepare our hearts to hail our coming king and make us ever ready for his coming in glory to raise the dead and renew the earth. And Lord, as we trace our king's last days on this earth, open our hearts and minds to see and to hear and to receive the gospel afresh, that we may again be wowed, awed, humbled, and moved to reverential worship and praise. For you live and reign with Jesus, our King, and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me this morning. Always love seeing your names pop up, welcoming your greetings. Love hearing from you during the week. Thanks again. The Lord's blessings on your day. We'll see you tomorrow.